Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted you could join us today for our Trailblazer Tuesday series featuring National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Homendy. I'm Dr. Karen Philbrick, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. MTI is a university transportation center funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. We focus on surface transportation research, workforce development, education, and technology transfer. To that end, we lead four competitively selected multi-university consortia with a focus on improving our nation's safety, accessibility, and convenience of our transportation systems. So with that, let me say hi to my dad really quick. Hi, dad. Um, we're going to get started here. I, I'm simply stunned that Chair Homendy is still joining us because as many of you likely know, there was a catastrophe in Baltimore with a bridge collapse. So she is actually joining us from the investigation. She is in a car, not driving, so she's safe. And she just finished a press conference. Yet her leadership is so incredible, she still wanted to honor this commitment so that you all could learn from her and best practices. Uh, this is our final installment for Women's History Month. And I have to tell you about Jennifer Hamadi. She's incredible. She was sworn in as, in as the 15th chair of NTSB in 2021 after being nominated by the president and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. In fact, she was just nominated by President Biden for a second term. She's a tireless safety advocate, and she is known for her empathy, her compassion, and her emotional intelligence. And a fun fact about that, when it was her birthday, her team got together and bought her a pair of shoes, a pair of high heels that say lady boss all over them. That's how much they love and celebrate her. So that's just great. Chair Homendy, let's get started. First of all, tell us about your day before, <laughs> before we get into the questions. I can't remember what time it started. I believe it was 3.30 a.m. So the um, vessel hit uh, the, uh, made contact with the bridge at around 1.30 a.m. I got a call at 3.30 a.m. There's some time where our team is looking for information uh, before we get a briefing. And so it started at 3.30 a.m. Uh, and I get this phone call and I just, bounced right up because I thought uh, I must have missed a text or something because we normally get texts, but thank thankfully I did not miss it. And that just started the whole day of um, uh, getting into work around 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock and then rolling into getting all our gear ready to go and getting in the car to drive to uh, Baltimore um, and uh, getting all the information we need coming. We're now at the North Command Post here with our federal, state, and local partners. And, um, you know, I just did a media briefing, although we don't have a lot to share because uh, search uh, the search efforts are ongoing. Uh, and then I met with uh, families earlier. So it is a long day and a long day ahead. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for your service and working so tirelessly to keep us all safe in every mode of transportation. Uh, a question, how do you balance having to talk with the families of people who are missing or or worse? How do you how do you maintain your professionalism and balance that with your humanity and your empathy? Um, so for me, uh the families, for, so just to explain for anyone who's watching, the chair and the board members of the NTSB are not the investigators. We have investigators here. Uh, of course, we are the spokespersons for the agency. And then I have the, I also run the agency. Uh, but our focus is the families are first. <clears throat> first and foremost are the families and making sure they have all the information they need. And we have a team that helps us do that, our transportation disaster assistance team. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, um, 
you know, obviously we do the media and we do, uh, we talk to some of the political entities that are calling or want to know what's going on or come out. But for families <clears throat> and balancing, providing factual information, do you have any more? Hold on, I got to get some water for a second. I'll Keep drink my own coffee. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, balancing the information between, hold on course this is real life everybody no, yes it is <laughs> uh, i luckily after the media briefing um so the for the families um you know i i can't imagine i mean here's here's a great example when i went to the dive boat fire and sinking in San, off santa cruz california i walk into a room of uh you know 30, 40, 50 people and uh, looking for information on their family members. Um, and it's every uh, emotion from uh, anger uh, to just despair. Uh, I mean, this is the worst day of their lives, mm -hmm. I imagine. And they've been waiting hours in a room to find out what happened. I can't imagine that. I mean, I'm a mom. I have a 16 year old. I, I can't imagine. I'm a wife. I can't imagine what that would be like. But I can imagine. I can imagine that it. It's just the despair mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. must be there. And what happened? And how did this happen? And what can you tell me? Uh, so it's providing the factual information in advance of any of that media that we provide because they deserve the information first. Uh, I don't ever want a family member to hear something from the NTSB for the first time on a TV screen. They should hear it from us. Uh, but on the empathy side, we're all human. <clears throat> and I think it's okay to be human. Uh, many times when I talk about uh, tragedy. Uh, I don't always just focus on physical injury because we always say, you know, five fatalities, uh, no, no injuries. But is it really no injuries? Because I would think emotionally, mm -hmm. it would be such a terrible mm -hmm. event to go through. So I always talk about the, the psychological pain. And we have to remember there's a lot here and a lot a lot of impacts, not just the physical ones that you can see. And so I think that must be, you know, that they are why everyone is at the NTSB. It's the families and the victims and uh, the survivors that drive our mission. Very good. And you brought up a couple of things I want to follow up on. So you're talking about vicarious trauma. And for those of you who might not be familiar, it leads to post-traumatic stress disorder where somebody has real or threatened death or is in close proximity to somebody who's experienced that. To that end, how do you support your team, the team that you lead, to ensure that they're not developing vicarious trauma symptoms and that they're supported and cared for? That's very important. Um, we have... Uh... Our teams, especially the investigative teams, are all trained uh, to be uh, peer uh, supportive, to be peer to peer support and, you know, uh, ask each other how we're doing. We also have a, a robust employee assistance program that provides employees with the assistance they need. We remind them that that is available and that they should utilize it. What that is, is really uh, time with a therapist uh, or uh, somebody else, not just a therapist. I mean, they also provide, provide financial support and other things, but um, support for the family. So they, uh, and for that investigator or other employee that they need, uh, a lot of times on scene, we will bring out therapy dogs or we will bring a EAP counselor uh, who will sit in all our meetings and make themselves available for group or 
private meetings. And then in addition to that, we have two personnel that are really focused on our wellness programs and talking about stress, bringing in speakers, focusing on wellness. It's very important, um, especially with uh, the tragedy uh, that we all see. Uh, that has a real impact. And so we are always focused on what can we do to support them first and foremost. We talk about uh, it in a way of uh, the oxygen mask. You have to put it on, you know, when the flight attendants tell you, if you have a child, put it on yourself first, you know, then address your child. It's the same thing. You know, we have to make sure that our folks get the support they need. Absolutely. And that's such a good point about self-care and making sure that you're strong and robust, if you will, resilient so that you can support others. Now I'm bouncing around a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mentioned one thing on that, Karen. Please. And again, thank you for having me. Uh, we just all experience, and it's not just uh, when we're out on an investigation, it's even day-to-day -day life. If there's a shutdown or there's a, of uh, the government or, you know, uh, we just experienced the death of our director of marine safety and it was very sudden and so we brought in people to support the team so it goes beyond just our investigations we have to support each other in the really difficult times absolutely and you just hit on a theme that we've heard from our other three speakers and that is the power of communication and social support in terms of helping everybody succeed and and flourish if you will now, you talked about being a mother. You talked about being a wife. You're also a daughter. You're a professional. You're a friend. How do you manage all of those roles effectively? Uh, I don't. <laughs> like, okay. I mean, that, that, you know, um, I, I, I do my best. Look, uh, I think all of us struggle uh, with with balance and managing our lives we do the best we can uh and it's never you know there there are so many things that i could do in addition to that but i have to be um you know i have to i have to just do the best i can and so it doesn't always work out that i'm effective on all of those things i i do i do fall down that is true but that's okay that's that's just how life is. And um, but I also will say um, for others, try to take some time to yourself as well. Uh, that is, you know, one that I try to do. I love to run. Uh, I love to bike. I love to swim. I have not had enough time uh, lately because I'm also trying to finish my master's degree, uh, which will be done <laughs> on May 10th. Uh, so yeah, I don't even know why, but, and so, um, it's a lot, uh, but try to do some things for yourself as well. I see one of, one of your comments, my friend, Lisa Min Harris, Kyle is on here. Go Tigers. Oh, Bridget Watson. I'm sorry. I see all your, your chats Wonderful. All my tiger team, Clemson Tigers, go Tigers. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's just wonderful. Now. I'm, you're talking about some cognitive reframing and making sure that you're not beating yourself up for doing self-care. I think when we manage many roles, sometimes we let ourselves suffer. And I'm curious about how you manage the self-talk, what's going on up here, because the description we assign and the words we use when speaking to ourselves often impact the experience. And what I like to say is the same neural pathways in your brain govern anxiety and excitement. So it's the narrative that you attach to it that kind of leads to action. How do you manage those internal voices? So uh, number one, I'll be honest, I, I have a therapist that I go to every two weeks. I'm a strong proponent of mental health uh, and I'm vocal about it. I go to somebody that I talk to uh, and she gives me really great exercises to do to to work on that. Um, it's tough, especially for women. We are our toughest critics ourselves. Oh yes, of our of our own self. Um, and I'll give you one story which I always I have since found very helpful to me. Uh, I was doing. I began triathlon in 2014, and um, when I started, I, I was a lifelong swimmer in a pool. 
And when I started, I started having panic attacks in open water swimming and I could not figure it out. Hmm. And my coach at the time sent me a questionnaire and I will know, I love this questionnaire. I have it posted at home. It's one uh, question after another about, okay, what are you thinking about when you're swimming? Uh, what, what, you know, what, uh, what are you feeling? What are you saying to yourself? And what do you want to say to yourself? What do you want to feel? And I all of a sudden realized in, in filling those questions out that, wow, I mean, I was really focusing on a lot of things that I was afraid of uh, that was driving my anxiety. Whereas if I had focused on uh, more positive things like, uh, you know, swimming and feeling the water uh, instead of the fear the whole time and feeling that it really made a huge difference, huge difference. So it's what we tell ourselves mm -hmm. that can be uh, the toughest thing. And listen, there's so much negativity out there. Uh, it's like when I try not to read the comments, I don't always succeed. There's so much negativity out there. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, really treat ourselves um, in a good way. And that also requires, um, you know, because we are doing so many things, moms, friends, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, parents, college students, uh, employees, heads of agencies, uh, we need to give ourselves a break sometimes too and say, you know what, we can't do it all. And that's okay. I'm just doing the best I can. That is so powerful. And, and for those of you who might not know, I'm actually a psychologist by training with a double master's and PhD in various disciplines. So your focus on mental health is so incredibly powerful, particularly in transportation, where we often are in the minority as women, and maybe some of our male counterparts are not as comfortable talking about their feelings and their emotions. But I want to wrap up what you said with one, one comment and observation, which is you said self-talk again, and your brain believes what you tell it. So you need to be yeah. careful of that narrative that you weave. And when you're focusing on that self-care, I love to think of one of my favorite quotes, which is time you enjoy wasting is not wasted time. I love to watch really bad TV, but I feel guilty about it because I should be enriching myself in some way. But nope, I'm going to watch my bad Grey's Anatomy and have a good time doing it. I love that show. Absolutely. 20 years mm -hmm. in. So question, have 20... you ever suffered from the imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you work through Oh, that? yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Actually, uh, when I came to the NTSB, because uh, all of a sudden I realized I I came to the NTSB. I was a staff director of a subcommittee on the House side for 14 years. And then I wrote speeches for many principals. I was writing for people the whole time and never really knew what my own voice was. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm a board member at the NTSB uh, you know, Senate confirmed. And I thought, oh, wait, what is my voice? What do I want to communicate? And all of a sudden I became afraid to do that. Uh, like, and then I thought, you know, what if, what if I don't know something, you know, what if I'm not the right person because I don't have a big aviation background? I don't have a Marine safety background. Uh, you know, uh, I, I I went back to grad school because I really love my passion is road safety. So I wanted to focus on that. But it, it's it can be tough. And I, I really believe everybody faces that at some point. And I faced it again when I became chair. Like, do I have the ability to lead this agency? And when I realized I'm not alone. OK, I'm not alone. I have 430 of the best people I've ever known in my life around me. Um, I have a Marine safety team. I have an aviation team. I have, uh, you know, and my own team uh, in the uh, chair's office. We are all working together for one goal to save lives. Not any of one of us needs to stand on our own. And I think when you realize that, um, 
you you are in a position, I believe, because you were called to be in that position. That is part of your calling. And uh, trusting in your team, I think, you know, over time, that sort of imposter syndrome, although that doubt uh, can uh, just disintegrate. Um, and I think it's very empowering when it does. Uh, uh, because then all of a sudden I became, I, I, there was a time I was afraid to ask the dumb question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where, well, what if I don't know what you're talking about on marine safety and I'm a presidential appointee uh, that Senate confirmed? I don't think I can tell you I don't know the answer. Uh, that's what I set up in my head when in actuality, the team was like, please ask me. I'd love to tell you everything about marine safety and more. And when, when you sort of realize it's okay, it's, it's okay to ask these questions. It's a, you are where you're supposed to be and make the most of it. Uh, I, I really think it, and it's hard sometimes to believe that I get it. There are bad days, uh, but focus on the things that happened on the good days. And, you know, you remind me of how social modeling is so important. You want to socially model the behavior you wish to be emulated. And in giving yourself permission to expose your soft underbelly or whatever, that what you don't know, you're giving permission to your team to do the same. Same with the self-care yep. piece. They see that you have a therapist or that you exercise, and that's part of caring for yourself. And that sets the expectation that they're allowed to care for themselves as well. Now, you talked about finding your own voice. I just want to zero in on that a little bit. Some recent scientific literature has shown that in meetings, men speak about 75% of the time and women about 25% of the time, even if there's more women in the room. What advice do you have for making sure your voice is heard? Mm -hmm. And that's the collective you. Yeah, that's a great listen. I have been in meetings as the chair of the NTSB, and I have been ignored. Uh, I, I will never forget a meeting I had where a demonstration of, of by a manufacturer was provided on something that was key to one of our investigations. Uh, and the all men in the room were speaking to my chief of staff, who was a man, and the entire time ignored me. And then asked which one of us wanted to go in the simulator. That would be me, right? Uh, it's uh, it happens a lot. Uh, do not be afraid to speak up. Never be afraid to speak up. Uh, I will also say, if you have other people in the room that you work with, support each other, mm -hmm. so that your voices are heard. Uh, and continue to make them heard. Uh, sometimes if you have somebody in the room uh, that you uh, maybe are running a meeting or part of a meeting, you could, and you notice they want to say something, if it's a, another woman, uh, you know, uh, a woman or somebody else who doesn't have their voice as heard as much, call on them. Say, what would, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what what would you what would you have to add? What do you think about this? Uh, and see see you know if they want to add something, uh, and just support each other in those meetings. I think, um, but it, it and then um, uh, a tr recruit and attract and hire women. Uh, you know the, the more voices at the table. There's al always these discussions about uh, what did I see some some thing on social media that said I was a DEI hire uh, from oh. the Alaska 1280. Oh, oh yeah. There's negativity all over there. You can't take that in. But uh, I actually laugh about it half the time because it's ridiculous, but, uh, but that's, that sentiment is out there, right? You know what? The more people, the more voices at our table means we will get to safety change because otherwise if I, even me, if I'm hearing from all me's, People who went to college, got a master's degree, uh, grew up in a middle income neighborhood, white, 50 years old, uh, you know, all, all of that, uh, 
if I'm only hearing from those people at a table, I'm only going to get one point of view. And this is why I say we need more diversity in our recruiting uh, and our hiring, but hire more women. I would love to see that. I could not have scripted that better. That was such a beautiful response. And when you talk about the plurality of voices, that leads to better viewpoints, more encompassing thoughts, and a better outcome. In fact, according to the Harvard Business Review and the International Monetary Fund, when women are well represented in the leadership positions, whether it's the C-suite or boards, that the return on investment can increase anywhere from 37 to 51% because of the power of those voices. So thank you for stressing that. Um, I'm going to look very quickly to see if anybody has posed a question. We have, so pardon me, I'm gonna read this verbatim. What do you wish someone would ask you about your work? What would, uh, about my work, what would I, do I wish someone would ask me about my work? Huh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. You got any suggestions, Stephen? I'm asking my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> what do I wish someone would ask about my work? Um, that is a really good question. I don't know. Um, I guess because I do it every day. Uh, I'm kind of stumped here. Uh, you know, my job, uh, our, our jobs, my job's very different. So um, one thing I often, what did you, he looks like he had a suggestion. Stephen here has a suggestion. Hi, Stephen. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen, watch. I, I, I don't think that sometimes you work with how in-depth they get. Oh, yeah, how in-depth we get. So, uh, you know, our our agency, so we have 430 people, five presidential appointees. The chair also runs the agency. Um, and uh, it is, it's very in-depth. For example, uh, for preparation for our East Palestine, Ohio train derailment board meeting that is coming up in June, uh, we have to read, each of us, 6,500 pages of evidence in our two public dockets, uh, get a number of briefings. It's very in-depth. This isn't just, you know, we're here for an investigation. It is very... Um, uh, fact-based, very in the weeds on evidence. I love it. That's what I thrive on. I love detail. I love research. I love to read things and write about them and talk about them. But I'm also uh, somebody who likes to know a lot about that issue. And so uh, it is a very in-depth position. You have to come ready to really work hard. Um, but in addition to that, then I have the day-to-day -day operations of the agency, which is everything from getting the funding the agency needs from Congress or from the White House to how we're hiring and do we need better, you know, hiring structure or what's going on with our federal employee viewpoint survey. I'm, and then what can we do uh, to bring about more engagement internally? So it's a lot. I saw somebody asked about a daily challenge. Yes. My daily, <laughs> so many daily challenges. <laughs> um, I mean, there are many. They are so minor from like every morning I get up and strive to drink. This sounds ridiculous, but I, I am dehydrated all the time. <laughs> so it's, and he's, Stephen's laughing. Yes. Uh, I mean, my daily challenge is I'm going to drink all my water today. It never happens. I drink coffee like it's going out of style. Um, but everything from, you know, can I get to my daughter's soccer game uh, once a week? Um, that's hard. Uh, will I, you know, there are different daily challenges. It changes every single day and sometimes by the hour because we're a multimodal agency. Uh, but it it's everything from personal uh, to taking care of myself, to taking care of the work at the NTSB. And I applaud you for drinking water because that can actually <laughs> reduce the likelihood of having a stroke. So <laughs> there you go. Wonderful. I wish we had longer, but that does bring us to a close. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of my family for helping to keep us safe. 
Thank you for managing to be a part of today's webinar, given everything that's going on. And thank you for giving us actionable intelligence that can enrich all of our lives. I know everybody is cheering behind the scenes for your comments. So I wish you a safe day and a productive day. And one last thought Thanks. before I go, MTI just released a report, Understanding Workforce Diversity in the Transit Industry, Establishing a Baseline of Diversity Metrics. If you're interested in learning more, a link to that report will be dropped into chat. And of course, later today, you'll receive a copy of the video. Thank you, Chair Hamandi. Stay safe. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the team. Really appreciate your time and, of course, your leadership as well. Thank you. And you have a wonderful day.